we resume on May 12th, above an island nine miles southwest of South City. The Z-Warriors have assembled to fight the incoming android menace, and so in an attempt to prevent the unnecessary loss of life, split up into teams of two to hunt the villains down. Cell and Trunks are the first team to depart, with Reddits and Nappa going soon after. After them are Gohan and Chi Chi, and then finally Tien and Krillin. Each group knows what to look for, a pair of teenagers, specifically a black haired boy and a blonde haired girl, and to raise their power level as a beacon if they find them. Though everyone is on high alert, no one has any luck, until almost half an hour later, when an explosion rocks the island. Converging on the side of the Calamity, our heroes find not a pair of teens, but an old geezer and a man-sized porcelain doll, both of whom are dressed in some of the strangest attire they have ever seen. Krillin asks if these are the androids, and the pair say that they are, with the doll man calling himself Android 19, while the old man calls himself Android 20. Trunks says they can't be the androids, he'll never forget the faces of the monsters who killed his dad, and these are definitely not them. Gohan then posits that perhaps the presence of Trunks and Cell in this timeline changed something, to which the Bugman eagerly agrees, saying that his memory banks tell him that Android 20 is Dr. Jiro, his creator, and most likely the creator of the other androids. Jiro confirms this, though when he looks around to see the speaker, his eyes go wide and he demands to know what Project Cell is doing here. Cell replies that he's under new orders now, and so lunges at the Doctor, Tell raised in attack position. Jiro narrowly avoids the attack, and before Cell can go in for another, Chi Chi yells at him not to fight here, since there are civilians around. Reddit adds that Kakarot always chose remote locations for fights, so they should go somewhere out of the way. Jiro sneers that he's still using that ridiculous codename for Son Goku, is he? Well, no matter the reason, he is one of Earth's greatest minds cracked that little code years ago, so Reddit can stop it, and Goku can stop hiding and come out to face him. Nappa and Reddit protest that it's not a code name, it's his true saying name, while Trunks, striking upon an idea for a scheme, tells Jiro that unfortunately Goku died nearly five years ago fighting Frieza. Jiro calls this impossible, saying that his surveillance drone scoured the battle site, recovering plenty of technological resources, and at no point during that time did they detect any sign of Goku's body. Gohan, picking up on what his cousin is doing, adds his voice to Trunks's, saying that this is because he was vaporized, meaning there was no body. He then adds that if Dr. Jiro's whole vendetta is against Goku, he should probably just give up and go home since his dad's dead. By now the others have figured out the plan and so begin to nod their agreement, but Juro laughs that they almost had him convinced for a moment. But no, he will not be outwitted. Goku is hiding somewhere like he said, and when he kills all his friends and family, the hero will feel compelled to show himself. Gohan sighs that that's really the doctor's choice, so be it. But he should remember they tried to spare him. The Z fighters then lift off into the air, telling Jiro and his companion to follow, and so the group depart for a wasteland a little way away. Touching down, Reddit's asks Jiro if he's sure that he doesn't want to leave, since he's pretty badly outnumbered here, but the doctor sneers that they could bring a whole army, and they would still pale before himself and 19. 19 then steps up to fight, but now it is Raditz's turn to sneer, and he says that in that case he'll take the first fight, since he's been itching for a chance to prove that no robot can best him. Trunks urges his father not to go it alone, but the fight has already begun, with Raditz transforming into a Super Saiyan and lunging at 19. As the Saiyan warrior swings a fist at the bleached bot's head, 19 ducks underneath and drives his own fist into Raditz's gut. He then states in his high-pitched voice that that is the power anomaly the drones detected at the end of the freezer fight, before firing a point-blank key blast that sends Raditz soaring into the distance. As Trunks goes to get him, Nappa steps up, saying that what Android 19 just described is Super Saiyan, the legendary power of their people. However, unlike Raditz, he has a different form, one those whatchamacallit drones have never seen, since he's never shown it off before. He then throws himself at the android, and as he approaches, there is no difference in his appearance, causing Jiro confidently to declare that Nappa is bluffing. However, at the last second before making impact, Nappa's muscle mass increases tenfold, and for an already bulky fellow, this transformation turns him into a flying ball of muscly death. Nappa's now bulging fist makes contact with 19's face, and such is the force of the punch that the spherical face becomes concave on one side, with one of 19's synthetic eyes shattering as the metallic socket is crushed in on itself. Nappa then flies past the bot, reverting to his normal size and panting a bit from the exertion of that move, as Krillin cheers that Nappa just used Master Roshi's muscle form. Nappa confirms this, then spins around to face 19, declaring that now he'll end things with another of his master's moves. He then fires off a Thundershock surprise, smiling that he's broken enough doohickeys in his time to know that when you overcharge a machine, it goes boom. 
However, instead of panicking, 19 extends a hand and from the little red gem at the center of his palm absorbs the attack, cackling to himself all the while. Nappa looks shocked, but Gohan states that this device on the android's hand must be some sort of key nullifier, and so they'll have to destroy it if they want to make use of their key-based attacks. From a way away, Trunks says he's on it, then moving at incredible speed appears directly beside 19, and swings his sword down to take the bot's hand off in one fluid motion. Trunks then prepares a point-blank key attack of his own to end things, but is stopped in his track when 19 gives the boy a real Thundershock surprise, by showing him what happens when his unshielded face comes in contact with a live wire. As Trunks writhes on the ground, Raditz re-enters the fray at the same time as Nappa, and the two Saiyans fire blasts at the round robot. But 19 leaps out of the way, and uses the smoke cloud caused by the two key blasts colliding to grab Raditz over the mouth with his remaining hand. He then grins that he is about to terminate Raditz, and starts charging up a key blast against the Saiyan's face. But before he can fire it, his mouth falls open in a comical O shape. Looking down, Raditz sees something pointy sticking out of 19's chest, and as the smoke clears, everyone sees Cell standing behind 19, his barbed tail having impaled the other android. In his gravelly voice, Cell informs 19 that unfortunately he can't allow him to kill Raditz, since his prime directive is to assist Trunks in his mission, and Trunks' mission is to keep Raditz alive. Cell's tail then snakes upwards, and in one ruthless motion, pierces Android 19 right between the eyes, skewering his central processor, and killing him instantly. As 19 relinquishes his hold on Raditz and drops lifelessly to the ground, the long-haired Saiyan coughs his gratitude to the big bug, as his son does likewise, shaking off the last of the spasms caused by his electrocution. Cell smiles that he was only doing his job, and so the trio plus Nappa, Gohan, and the humans all converge on Dr. Jiro. Trunks tightens his grip on the sword, saying this time he's not going to fool around by aiming for the arm, but Cell counsels his fellow future dweller to think carefully about this decision, since they they still need Jiro alive to show them where the androids from their timeline are. Trunks shouts that they can't risk letting Jiro get anywhere near the androids, since he might team up with them, but Cell counters that they can kill the Doctor long before he manages that, while on the other hand if they allow the real androids to stay hidden, they could strike at any time, which is a much greater risk, and would largely invalidate all the effort they've put into saving this timeline. Jiro tries to use this moment of discord to escape, but as he flees he feels a sudden pain across his elbows and torso, and looks down to see a sword of Ki bisect him horizontally. As Jiro's limbless upper half clatters to the ground, Krillin as the person who fired the attack approaches him and smirks that Cell said they need him alive, not intact. Jiro calls this an outrage, but Cell tells him to shut up as he places a large three-toed foot on his creator's face and begins to slowly press down. Sounding a little panicked, Jiro calls out that Cell said he can't kill him, so even now he still has the upper hand. In unison, Trunks, Gohan, and Raditz quip that that's ironic coming from a man who just lost both hands, but ever serious Cell grins that the doctor is right. He can't kill him, but he has something in mind far worse than death. He then lifts Jiro by the head and blasts off into the sky. The others don't know what their friend is planning, and so take off after him, and to their shock quickly realize that Cell is taking Jiro the lookout. With his head start, the bio-android and his prey are the first to land, with the startled Goku demanding to know what Cell's doing bringing Jiro here. Menace in his voice, Cell replies, Negotiating. Then storms past the Guardian. When he reaches the door of the time chamber, Cell kicks it open and thrusts Jiro forward, so he has no choice but to stare into the endless void of white stretching before him, and start to feel the pressure of the magnified gravity. In a low voice, Cell then asks Jiro if he implanted all the androids with salvage scouters from Frieza's first invasion, like he did in his timeline. And still trying to sound haughty, Jiro replies that he did. Sol grins that this is wonderful news, since it means the Doctor will have a way to contact him when he's ready to be more cooperative. Then, without a moment's hesitation, hurls Jiro's mutilated head and torso deep into the chamber. By now the other Z fighters have arrived, and they all witness this display, as well as Cell slamming the door and turning to face them with a self-satisfied look on his face. Once more Goku asks Cell what he's doing, and Cell grins that from what he's heard about the hyperbolic time chamber, it will surely break Jiro's spirit in no time, which will in turn lead him to telling them where Android 17 and 18 are. Chi Chi gasps that what Cell's proposing is torture, but Cell growls that Jiro is a genocidal madman trying to initiate the end of the world. If anyone deserves a little torture, it's him. Goku, Gohan, and the humans protest, saying that for all his sins, he's still a person and no one deserves that sort of cruelty. However, Trunks, Raditz, and Nappa admit that they actually agree with Cell on this one. 
This causes the Z fighters to all look at each other with reproachful expressions, but Cell speaks up, appealing to Goku directly. He says that Goku made the ultimate sacrifice for Earth, and it's clear that he would go to any lengths for his home, and his friends, so he must understand how Cell feels when he says that he will do anything, no matter how much he may regret it, to prevent the hellish future he and Trunks live in from coming to pass here as well. Goku admits that he does, and so the big bug pats the Guardian on the shoulder in a gesture of solidarity, thanking him, and asking him to trust him when he says that this is in the best interest of Earth and everyone who lives here. Goku gives no response to this, instead simply warning Cell that if Jiro's in there for more than in two years, the door will vanish, and they won't be able to get him out. Cell so breezily replies that who said anything about getting him out? Let the old monster waste away in isolation. But when even hardened veterans like Reddits and Trunks give him a look of disgust to this claim, he hastily adds that this was a joke, and that he's certain Jiro will crack long before the two year time limit is up. And so the waiting game begins. Cell guards the door, his eyes close as if waiting for any ping on his indolt scouter, though even in this state he is alert enough to intercept Chi Chi and Krillin when they attempt to sneak into the chamber to check on Jiro. Chi Chi makes the point that he might die in there if left alone, and then they'll be left without their only lead. But Cell assures her that Jiro is alive and will be for a very long time. A look of shame then crosses the bug's face, and he confesses that for all his attempts to be nothing like his creator, at his core they are the same. And so that is how he knows that it is not food or drink that sustains Jiro, it is spite. And the miserable old codger will be stewing in it right now, all alone in the crushing void. Meanwhile, Goku is training with Nappa, having watched the fight with 19 and been quite impressed by the power of the bald man's muscle form. Super Saiyan is vastly superior in the long run, but in short bursts Nappa manages to give the Guardian a run for his money. To the side, Reddits and Trunks are both talking with Gohan. They both praise his quick thinking and analytical mind, for not only pulling a fast one on Jiro, but also figuring out all his tricks and tactics as well. Gohan smiles, though when he spots Cell from the corner of his eye, he grows uneasy, still being in two minds about what they're doing with Jiro. And worse, the impact Jiro's appearance has had on their usually docile bug buddy. Thankfully, Unky Raditz is there to calm the boy's furrowed brow, and so he and Trunks offer to train a bit with Gohan, since he's still yet to become a Super Saiyan, and thanks to Trunks they do know it's possible for a hybrid Saiyan to attain the form. Gohan agrees, and so the rest of the day is spent in training. With each passing moment, everyone's nerves strain more and more, as the battle of wills with the not-so-good doctor stretches into the night, and even into the next morning. The next day is spent similarly, though with Chi Chi now trying to take her family's mind off the tense situation by proposing they all have a picnic in the lookout's garden. Even Bulma and Baby Trunks come up for this, and the other Z fighters join in when it becomes clear that the invite is extended to them as well. The only one not in attendance is Cell, who stays outside the time chamber door, now visibly agitated by Jiro's stubborn refusal to give up. Shortly before dawn on the second day, Goku approaches the bio-android and tells him the hyperbolic time chamber is too valuable a resource to lose, so if Jiro hasn't cracked by 9am, which will be almost two full years for the doctor, then he will enter the room himself and bring Jiro out. This frustrates Cell, but he complies, and so when the others come out to see if there is any news, they find the bug pacing back and forth, muttering darkly to himself. Gohan tries to comfort the bio-android, who gives him one of his odd beak-mouthed smiles and pats the boy's head, saying that he has a good soul for caring so much about him, even though he's an android like the enemy. But Gohan smiles that even if he is an android, that doesn't make him like Jiro or the androids from his timeline, any more than being a Saiyan makes Gohan like the evil Saiyans Anki Reddits told him about. Soul was given a chance to be good, and just like his dad and the other Saiyans here, that's what matters. Soul calls Gohan a wise young man, and even when Gohan departs, he seems to mull these words over. 8.55 comes and goes with no word from Jiro, then 8.56, 57 and 58. Finally at 8.59, Goku tells Cell that he's sorry, but time's up, so they may have to accept that Jiro isn't going to tell them where the androids are, and if their energy really can't be sensed, then this might be the end of this fight. Cell growls his annoyance, but then the slits of his pupils shrink to pinpricks, and he calls for silence. The Z fighters agree, and so for a moment there is stillness as Cell listens to something before grinning that Jiro has agreed to lead them to his lab. The heroes are delighted by this, and so Cell collects Jiro before everyone, sans Goku, departs the lookout. 
When they reach Shiro's lab, Sol grows furious, and Trunks, assuming the bug feels the same anger as him at being so close to the androids that ruined their world, puts a comforting hand on his shoulder. However, Cell admits that that isn't it. It's that this is the lab where he was made, so not only does it bring back painful memories of the monster he was before Mistress Bulma, but also infuriates him that he wasted so much time when he should have guessed the Doctor would be too arrogant to plan for one of his creations turning against him. Shiro doesn't protest this claim, and this twigs something in Gohan. On. The Jiro has been oddly quiet and self-assured after leaving nearly two years of agonizing isolation. The boy points this out to his allies, and Raditz says he's right, demanding to know what Jiro is planning. Jiro just sneers that a simpleton like Raditz couldn't begin to comprehend his grand design, but he should know that from the beginning everything has played out exactly as he has planned. The Saiyan fumes at this insult, but Trunks mockingly asks if Jiro planned for this, then swings his sword downwards, bisecting the madman and silencing him permanently. As the two halves of Jiro clatter to the ground, specks of purple fluid also fall, and Trunks looks up to see that in his overzealous response, he accidentally cuts Cell's hand almost perfectly in half. The son of Raditz apologizes, but his fellow future dweller says he's fine, before holding the wound with his other hand and allowing his biology to knit his hand back together. However, unlike the Cell of Canon, this is a feat requiring concentration, which takes more time and stamina, thanks to his Namekian DNA making up less of his overall genetic makeup and coming from a weaker version of the source. When Cell is fully healed, the group finally blow open the doors to the lab and step inside to find several pods bearing the designations 17 and 18. Cell gleefully tells his comrades to stand by, since he was designed specifically to neutralize their powers, and so approaches the pods. Piercing through them with his tail, he absorbs 17, followed by 18, and then is overcome with a white aura that radiates power the likes of which the Z Fighters have never felt. Not only in terms of its incredible strength, but also because of how as it grows, it becomes harder and harder for everyone but Gohan to read. Soon it reaches the state where only Gohan can read it accurately, and at this point the hybrid Saiyan feels something chilling, the unmistakable presence of evil in Cell's aura. When Cell's metamorphosis is complete, he stands tall, handsome and regal in his perfect form, and as he surveys the others, Gohan feels it again, pure malice. In a worried voice, he asks the bio-android if he's feeling alright, and when Cell sees the concern on his face, he smiles that he's never felt better, and starts walking towards the group to show off his new perfect form. However, before he can even make it three paces, he screams and collapses to his knees, hands clutched around his head. The big bug then yells that the evil android's programming is trying to reset him to his villainous ways from before Mistress Bulma found him, so he needs the other's help at once. The heroes naturally rush in to assist, and only when they get close do they see the sinister smirk on Sol's face, right before he raises his arms to reveal that he wasn't in fact clutching his head, but instead charging an orb of key behind it. He then allows himself the smallest of benign cackles before slamming the key ball into the ground beneath the Z fighters and smirking. Just kidding. The entire mountain is then flattened into a plateau by this attack, and when Gohan's vision returns, he sees that the humans are all unconscious, with many bad burns afflicting their bodies, while his uncle, cousin, and Nappa are in little better condition, even if they are still standing. Trunks takes the lead, being the first to lunge at Cell. Sword drawn, he swings at the biomechanical villain, but Cell simply extends an arm to shatter the blade cleanly in two, and send the top half spinning into the air. He then gloats that Trunks should know nothing he said about his future is true. Trunks did return in his timeline. He even managed to kill the androids and avenge his dear daddy, but then he, Cell, awoke and slaughtered both him and his mother, making his whole heroic quest utterly pointless. Trunks growls that it's not pointless if he freed the world from android tyranny, and this irks Cell, who says that if the spiky-haired youth is the arbiter of what is and isn't pointless, he should tell him where this falls on the scale. He then grabs the top half of Trunks' blade out of the air and stabs it through Trunks' hand, exactly where Trunks split his earlier. The pain is unbelievable, and as Trunks passes out from it, Raditz rushes in to tend to his future son, while Nappa steps up to face Cell. Like in the battle with 19, he attempts to use a quick switch into his muscle form to batter the bug, but Cell has seen this trick before, and so as Nappa goes sailing through Cell's afterimage, the bioandroid appears behind him and delivers a chop just below the neck which shatters Nappa his spine, completely paralyzing him. Cell then advances on Gohan, and when Raditz sees this, he charges in from behind, becoming a Super Saiyan and firing off a double Sunday. Sensing this, Cell turns around and counters the attack with a lazy Kamehameha, which causes both attacks to detonate. 
He then looms out of the smoke and delivers a wicked headbutt to the top of Raditz's skull, which not only knocks him out, but causes a large crater to form beneath the long-haired Saiyan, so that when he falls, several small boulders fall in as well to bury him. With the Saiyans now dealt with as well, Cell returns to his original plan and approaches Gohan, kneeling down to cup the boy's trembling face. In an almost fond tone, Cell informs Gohan that he is the only one of the Z fighters he actually respects, since the boy always treated him as an equal, rather than training equipment or a weapon against the androids. For that reason, he intends to give him two gifts, the first of which is that he will allow Gohan to walk away from this encounter unharmed, the second he will give in four days time to celebrate the boy's 10th birthday. Nervously, Gohan asks what it is, and Cell smirks that the boy really doesn't like surprises, does he? Dryly, Gohan questions if Cell would, if the last one he received was a friend of several years betraying him. Cell retorts that he was never the Z Fighter's friend. He merely got ambushed before he was ready and had to keep up the ruse until they invariably led him to the androids. However, he wasn't lying when he said Gohan possessed a wisdom beyond his years, and so his second gift is one inspired by Gohan himself. A chance. Specifically a chance to defend Earth from him, or a chance to run and live out their last few days off the battlefield. What they do with that chance is up to each of them, but Gohan should tell the others that when the fated day arrives, he will be fighting to the death. And should he still be standing by the end of the day, he will destroy the planet. And then, without another word, Cell departs, leaving Gohan to tend to his friends and family, and share the grim news that in four days time, either Cell will fall, or the earth will.